Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kerber Rose's webinar on the best practices for tracking paytech protection program loans and expenses. We're so happy you could join us today and to learn more about the PPP loan. My name is Autumn Johnson, and I'm the marketing coordinator here at Kerber Rose, and I'm just here helping our presenters out today with directing questions. Um, so before we begin, um, we just want to remind everyone to be sure they've muted their microphones. Um, this feature is found at the bottom of your screen. It's a nice big red microphone button. Um, but as you might notice, we're getting a little bit of feedback right now. So that means someone needs to make sure their microphone is muted. We appreciate your help in keeping this presentation um, distraction free. So that same rule applies to people calling in on your phone. Make sure that your phone microphone is muted. Um, we very much appreciate your help with this. Um, today, we're also going to be utilizing the chat feature for all of our questions. And this is located at the bottom of your screen as well. So please utilize this feature to ask questions when you have them. And we'll do our best to answer them as we go along or during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. We also want to remind you to watch your email in the coming days as we will follow up with the recording of this presentation, additional resources, and information about upcoming online events. So now that we've covered those basic rules, I'd like to introduce you to our presenters today. We have Karen Kerber, CPA and shareholder in charge of audit, and she will be giving the specifics of the PPP loan, like allowable expenses and calculating loan forgiveness. And we also have Dana Conrad, manager and QuickBooks Pro Advisor here at Kerber Rose. And she will lead you through tracking these expenses in QuickBooks. And with that, I will now pass the torch over to our first presenter so she can kick off today's presentation for us. Thank you, Autumn. Uh, appreciate the introduction. So we're going to kick off our program today. Uh, first of all, covering some big basics on the next slide related to the PPP um, program. Oh, I guess I fibbed to you. Uh, this is my disclaimer first on uh, that previous program. Um, just want to remind you that the information we're sharing today is the information that we know of as of today. As if you've been paying attention or seeing any of the news you're fully aware that they seem to keep coming out with additional guidance or tweaks or changes. So we do check this daily. Um, and our presentation today is based on the information we know um, as of today. So with that, as we move on to the next slide, just as a quick general overview, um, I'm assuming all of you are on the call because you have now received your PPP loans. But just as a reminder, those PPP loans were based on your payroll costs, probably for the 2019 annual year, or in some cases, maybe the 12 month period just prior to your application. The PPP program is designed to provide for 100% of loan forgiveness. And we'll talk a little bit about um, spending those dollars on during the covered period and then what's allowable versus forgivable. Um, and remember, these loans themselves were not taxable, but at least right now, the IRS has came and said, yeah, we're not going to tax you on those proceeds, but we're not going to allow you to deduct the expenses, which really means that it ends up being a wash to you. So that's our general uh, overview. So a little bit on the allowable versus forgivable expenses. So as you are spending the monies, the allowable expenses that you can use your PPP proceeds for are your payroll costs, which remember includes your wages, tips, your self-employment income, if you happen to be self-employed and are on the call today, and that's either for sole proprietors or partners, the cost of group health insurance, any retirement that you may be paying on behalf of your individual employees or yourself, as well as your state unemployment tax. It also includes other expenses, such as the mortgage interest, rent, utilities, but remember that those things needed to be in place um, prior to February 15th of 2020. You can also deduct other interest on debt obligations as long as that debt was incurred before February 15th of 2020. 
received a number of questions about, well, in the past, I haven't paid myself rent. Can I start paying myself rent now? No. Um, if it hasn't been in place prior to that date, you cannot use your PPP funds to suddenly start paying rent to yourself or to another entity. So how is that different from the forgivable expenses? Well, really, it's all the same exact expenses. There's just one caveat. You need to um, incur and pay these items that are allowable expenses during that eight-week period um, from when you've received your PPP funds. So that's really the difference between the allowable versus the forgivable. So as I mentioned, for those items to be um, forgivable, they need to be incurred and paid. And I'll show you some examples of that a little bit later um, in regards to how that can end up being a little bit confusing, um, but they must be incurred and paid during that eight week period. And remember your eight week period starts on the date that you received the funds from your financial institution. It does require that you spend at least 75% of your PPP loan proceeds on those payroll costs that I mentioned. And it does also state that not more than 25% of the loan forgiveness can be for those other items. So how do we go about managing our forgiveness? Well, you have to keep a few things in the back of your mind to try and really maximize the amount of forgiveness that you're going to be allowed because your loan forgiveness can be reduced if your full-time employee headcount, your FTE, which stands for full-time equivalent, if it's decreased during that covered period, remember that's that eight-week period, compared to either your FTE during the period of 2:15, February 15th of 2019 to June 30th of 2019, or for the period of January 1st, 2020, to February 29th, 2020. And you'll see in an example um, how that comes into play and how you would really determine which one of those periods you wish to use for calculating whether or not you've reduced your employee um, headcount. Can also be reduced if you, re if you would happen to lower any individual employee's salary or wages by more than 25% during that eight week period. And you are um, allowed uh, an exemption for forgiveness um, for any full-time employment and or salaries if you restore them by June 30th. So basically, even if you temporarily reduce your employees, as long as you get them back in place by June 30th, um, that is also an important factor to keep in mind. So when it comes to calculating your forgiveness, there really is five steps that you end up con considering. And the first one is any loan proceeds that you do not spend on those forgivable costs. Remember, those are allowable costs that you incurred and paid during that covered period. Those will not be forgiven. So in the simple example that um, we have noted on this slide, you see that the PPP loan was a total of $100,000 but only $75,000 was spent on forgivable expenses during that covered period. So very basically, first step, you know that your forgiveness is only going to be $75,000 and not obviously the full 100,000 because you have not spent the entire proceeds. The next step um, comes brings into the idea of you can't spend more than 25% of those proceeds on items other than payroll costs. So we mentioned early on or in one of the first slides that no more than 25% can be spent on non-payroll costs. So again, very simple example, kind of carrying over from the previous slide. The total PPP loan is $100,000 and you spent a total of 75,000 but say only 50 grand was spent on payroll costs and the other 25 grand was spent on non-payroll costs. Well, that is more than 25% of the full 70 of the 75,000 that you spent. So they're gonna reduce it a little bit more. And the easiest way to do that or to know what that number is going to be is you simply take the 50 grand that you did spend on payroll costs and divide that by 75%. 
So in this case, even though you spent 75,000, it's going to be reduced more because you can't use that 100 grand as your base for determining whether or not you spent 25% of the total loan. It has to be figured in of what you actually spent. So you can see there that only $66,667 of your amounts would actually be forgiven. Then we're going to move on to the next step, which step three is you may have an additional reduction in the forgiveness if you happen to decrease your full-time equivalents during that com covered period compared to what they call a baseline period. One of the first slides, I mentioned this idea of how many full-time equivalents you had during the period of either February 15th through June 30th of 2019 or between January 1st and February 29th of 2020. When you are looking at this particular step, you are always going to want to choose the lower of those two numbers because basically you're going to take the number of full-time equivalents that you have during your covered period and you're going to divide that by one of those two numbers. The lower that number, the better or the higher the percentage is that you will be able to obtain for the forgiveness. And I can demonstrate that a little bit more with an actual calculation on the next slide, which where you can see in this particular example, still working off that original $66,667 that we came up with, say during that covered period, and remember that's that eight week period from when you received your PPP loans to the end, you had a total of nine full-time equivalents. Well, if your full-time equivalents between February 15th to June 30th of 2019 were 10 and a half, and, or the full-time equivalents between January 1st to February 29th, 2020 were 10, you can see that down below, you may have an additional reduction of the 66,667 times nine tenths. And that nine tenths is simply the nine full-time equivalents you had during the covered period divided by the lower of that number, because that is what's going to get you the most forgiveness. So you can see in this scenario, you would receive forgiveness of $60,000. There's an additional step um, that we call the fourth step here that also comes into play if you happen to reduce any one employee's wages by more than 25% during that covered period. And what you're going to do is compare the wages that you are paying to each individual employee during the covered period versus that same eight week period um, compared to the full most, I'm sorry, during the full uh, most recent full quarter. So you're gonna basically compare that eight week period wages to a similar eight week period during the most recent full quarter for that particular employee. And that also can result in some additional uh, reduction in your forgiveness. Hopefully the next slide can help that make some sense. Um, this one, I changed it up and I'm not continuing to build on the other uh, dollar amount. So in this case, the full PPP loan was $100,000. And all of those dollars were spent on expenses that were incurred and paid during that period, and they were for allowable expenses. So we're starting with the full maximum forgiveness of $100,000 in this case. The owner did reduce employees. As you can see, they started out with 25 full-time equivalents during the eight-week period, and they're comparing that to the number of full-time equivalents that they had during either one of those measurement periods. And remember again, that's those dates from 2019, as well as comparing it to the ones for January through February of 2020. And in this case, they did have 30 employees during that period of time. So their forgiveness is going to be reduced by that quotient or that formula that you see there, the 25 divided by 30. In addition, they had one individual on their payroll 
that they decided to outsource some of their work, not pay the individual as much money as what they had been in the past. So in this case, the overall salary went from $20,000 to $10,000, which based on the math, dropping it 50%, um, that's going to reduce that salary or that forgiveness by an additional $5,000. So you can see you do have to look at that on each individual employee, um, and it's not based on the total growth. So you can't simply say, hey, I paid out the same payroll. Um, you have to look at each individual employee for this particular calculation. Just another uh, quick example on how you would go about calculating that reduction on an individual employee basis there. You can see employee A earned $35 hundred dollars um, each week for a two-week pay period during the most recent full quarter um, before that covered period. So the largest amount that you could decrease their pay without it affecting your forgiveness would simply be the 3500 times 25 percent or 875 dollars. If the employee's A pay was reduced by 1500 dollars in each of those two-week pay periods, the amount not forgiven is going to actually end up being $625 for each of those pay periods, the $1,500 less the $875 that you could reduce it by. So if you look at that over the total of the four weeks, you can see easily um, that it's basically the $2,500 that you would lose for the forgiveness calculation. So a lot of you might be there saying, well, I already reduced my staff. Now what do I do? Well, there is some good news in this, and that is if you can cure any reductions in employee employment or salary that you may have had during February 15th of 2020 through April 26th of 2020, you can um, get that cured if you can basically get your employees back to full time um, or back to the same full-time equivalents, not necessarily full-time, excuse me. If you can get back to the same number of full-time equivalents by the end of June, then both of those previous calculations that we just went through, they basically get tossed out the window. Um, that, then you don't have to worry about that you reduce staff or that you reduced wages. Important to remember, if you can get things back to normal by June 30th, um, there will be no impact on the forgiveness. Um, just also remember, uh, because you are looking at that number of full-time equivalents at a, a point in time, you should also real, uh, um, understand that if you don't have any reductions in your full-time equivalents during your eight-week period versus February 15th and April to February 15th of 2020 to April 26th of 2020, there will not be any impact on your forgiveness either. Um, had been receiving a number of questions about, you know, I'm trying to pull my employees back and they just don't want to come back to work. I've offered them employment. Now what do I do? Because it's impacting the number of full-time equivalents that I have. Um, the SBA uh, through the Treasury did come out with some additional guidance and indicated that if there was an employee who is rejecting coming back to work, that will not affect your calculations for determining the amount of your forgiveness. It is very important that you try and have this documented in writing in some form. So either through email, send something to your staff saying, hey, we need you to come back to work. Save that email when they decline to come back to work. If you do it through text, do a screenshot of your phone, do something so that you have documentation to support that you made a good faith effort of trying to bring that employee back, but they declined. So, um, again, just a, an example of if you rehire the employees by June 30th, um, a full forgiveness example. So their firm had 100 employees on February 15th of 2020, they laid off 25 employees in March, but then rehired them by June 30th. If the firm used all of their funds for qualified expenses that were forgivable during that covered period, the firm will get 100% loan forgiveness. On the flip side, if there was 100 employees as of February 15th, 
but 25 were laid off and they did not get rehired. Again, assuming that the proceeds were used for forgivable expenses during that qualified period, only $75,000 of that loan would be forgiven. Simply the $100,000 times 25 divided by, I'm sorry, um, times uh, 75 divided by 100. So that's how we would come up with the 75,000. We're going to go but, through some tips and techniques and risks regarding the PPP loan. So right now you guys do need to decide whether you're going to use the loan proceeds for forgivable or allowable expenses. You need to come up with a game plan so that you're ready ahead of time. You need to decide whether to spend the proceeds during the covered period or after the covered period, but before the June 30th of 2020. Decide whether you're going to spend more than 25% on the expenditures on non-payroll items or if you're going to try to keep it the loan at the 75% and the 25%. Um, calculate your eight weeks. You want to budget and use the loan forgiveness correctly. I'll also show you in a little bit how to track these expenses in QuickBooks. This is a good way to allow you to start out with the loan balance and show as you go Go through the eight weeks, how to decrease that loan, and so that you know how much you spent on the loan. Um, another good thing is to always keep track of your expenses. Maybe create a folder where you can keep a copy of your utility expense in it or your telephone bill so that you have documentation of spending the loan proceeds on the correct information so that when the bank has to look at your information, you can hand them a folder and everything's there that you need to prove your expenses. Um, be careful. There's forgivable expenses that must be incurred and paid. So an example of this, if you got your loan on May 6th, but you paid your May rent and May 1st, that's not going to work. It's got to be paid with the, from the day of your loan eight weeks forward. So you'll be using your rent from the June and the July. And then please document, you know, the rent is paid. Have some kind of a documentation for the lease that proves that you are rent is due and that you are supposed to be paying it so that you're not making it up, um, that the bank knows this is a legit expense. Um, the payroll expenses can be trouble if they're not managed correctly. So it's always going back to that incurred expenses. So in this example, it's telling us that the pay period was April 1st through April 15th and it was paid on April 20th of 2020. The loan proceeds were received on April 16th, so they were received before the payroll date of April 20th, but they're not going to qualify because the expense was not incurred during that eight week. So to be forgivable, it has to be within that eight week time period. So we want to make sure that we're paying the expenses in the correct period. I believe there's one more slide that talks about, you may have to be prepared to run a special payroll so if your payroll, so it's the eight-week period ends on June 10th, but your payroll is really not dated till June 20th, you're going to want to take into consideration running that payroll early so that you can take advantage of that loan proceeds for that payroll. So it's kind of organizing yourself, looking at your pay periods, looking at your timetable. When should I get this payroll run? Should I run it early? Definitely work on somehow that you can run it early and get the employees paid so that you can use that payroll correctly with this eight weeks. All right, so right now I'm going to change my screen to go to the QuickBooks so I can show you how to set up. Dana, um, yeah. while you do that, if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump in and answer a couple of the questions that have shown up in the chat while we've been yep. talking. Okay. Sure. Um, so one of the first questions I hear, I see here is, is there a definition for utilities? Yes. Um, at this point, utilities includes the obvious ones like electric, gas, water, sewer, telephone, and internet. Um, those are the ones that are included as part of the definition of utilities. If you have a specific question on one, wondering if it's included, uh, type that in there. I'm, I'm going from memory on the ones that are included, and I think I covered them. 
It says, the next question is, the full-time covered period should be the lesser of the two periods from my understanding. So that is for when you're calculating the number of full-time equivalents that you may have reduced, you are going to want to pick the lesser of those two date ranges that I had on the previous slide. And we will have these slides available for you. I think there was a question coming up about that as well. And we certainly will provide the slides for you so you can have those for reference. But yes, you're always gonna wanna pick the lower of, of those two particular items. There's a question here on explaining how a 1099 individual's loan is forgiven. So if you are self-employed and or a partner, you're not normally running a payroll for yourself. Um, it is imperative that you look at what your earnings were and you cut yourself a check during this eight week period. You need to demonstrate that you paid these funds out. So if you're not used to taking a distribution or some kind of amount out of your business on a regular basis, you got to do it during this eight week period. You could do it, you know, once a month. You could do it all at the end. You can do it all at the beginning. You can do it weekly, every other week. I don't care how you decide to do it, but please make sure you write yourself a check, get that out of your business account and get it deposited over to your personal account. Someone might be saying, well, you know, I don't really have separate accounts. Okay, write yourself a check. And if you have to redeposit it to that account, but it's imperative that you show that you are actually paying those amounts out. Um, I see Dana has her screen up, so I'm gonna let her take back over and then we'll circle back around to the additional questions that I see out there. Okay, I'm going to walk you through setting up chart of accounts. So some of the loan proceeds from the bank were deposited into your normal checking and some banks decided to set up a new checking. So either way, whatever happened to you, um, as long as you have your bank account set up so that you can deposit the funds into it. The other account we're going to set up is um, we're going to set up the loan itself. So we're going to go to the bottom here. We're going to click on account and we're going to say new. Now we want the type of this loan to be an other current liability. And as you can see, there is nothing listed here for other current liability. But wait, if we go down here where it says other account types and drop the down arrow, there it is. We're going to pick other current liability. We're going to hit continue. Um, we can. Give it an account number. If you use account numbers, you don't have to use account numbers, but you can. And then in the account name, we'll just go ahead and name it account pay or note payable, the PPP, or whatever you're comfortable with. The name doesn't matter, but whatever works for you. So that's one of the accounts we're going to create. I'm going to create one more while we're in here. So I'm just going to hit this button here where it says save and new allows me to create another one. Save and close allows the screen to go away. So we're going to hit save and new. The type of this account we're going to create is going to be other income. So this will be the offset account to help reduce the loan as we go along. And again, if you feel you need to put in an account number, you can create the account number. So the account name we'll use doesn't matter the name. I'm just going to use other income and just name it the PPP. Kind of staying consistent knowing that I've got the PPP account created. Um, from there, we can hit save and close can see that there's one of my entries I just created. All right, so if I click the home button and I hit record deposit, I want to record the deposit, the funds that the bank gave to me. I'm going to create or um, look for the correct bank account num um, account that was used, whether you're creating a new one or you're using one that was in existence. Then the from account is going to be that one I just created with that note payable for the PPP loan. One more key part in here, too, is to make sure that the date is the date that the bank put the loan proceeds into your account. You want to make sure you got the correct date because the dates play a big part in this. And you can fill in the memo stating, you know, the loan is from the um, payroll protection program. And then you can tab down and you can fill in the dollar amount um, that you received for the loan. 
once you have that filled in, then you can go ahead and hit save and close. If I go back to my chart of account and I go to find the um, loan that I created, I can see now that my loan has $150,000 into it. Now, what do I do after I run payroll or I pay an expense? Um, well, let's see. Let's go write a check as if we were going to pay our telephone bill. So let's say we had to pay um, Frontier. So I had to pay Frontier, my telephone bill, $1,000. Just going to delete a couple lines here. I don't need to break it out in my example. Um, so I'm going to have the $1,000. So now the second line I could use is my note payable. So as I'm writing this check, I could offset the loan right away if I wanted, if I preferred. And then the offset to the loan would be the other income which I created. So now it's going to go to my telephone expense and it's also going to hit my loan and my other income. I want to show you the effect of this. So I'm going to hit save and close. Now, if I go back to that note payable, I can see now that here's my loan, and I've now decreased it by that thousand, giving me the ending balance of 149,000. So it's a way to track my expenses as I go, knowing I've got 149,000 dollars to use yet for the loan. If you don't want to do those entries on a check, you can also go up to company and make a general journal entry. So same thing, um, I can use the note payable, reducing the loan by that thousand, offsetting it with the other income account. So doing the two entries, hitting save and close, noticing that it lands in my loan again. Um, the other entry that will need to be done, so you'll have your utilities, you can have your rent, you can do all those entries. You also do the payroll. So after you have a payroll run, you'll be able to make a journal entry for the gross amount of the payroll. So if you had a payroll and we wanted to record the, may say my payroll is 35000 then I would go in here, debit the loan, and I would credit the other other income account and feel free to use the memos to write that you had a payroll um, and the, put the payroll date in there that it happened. And then save and close. Then I can always go back to this loan and I can see, yep, my payroll entry has hit. I can see my loan is decreasing. So it's kind of a way for you to track um, the loan balances as you go along. Also keeping documentations in your folder of proof of these things, keeping a payroll summary to prove your payroll, um, just so that you know how you got to these um, numbers as we go along. Are there questions on the entering of it in QuickBooks? Should I go back to the PowerPoint or stay here? Um, why don't you drop back to the PowerPoint and okay. while you're doing that, I can take a couple of more of the, of the questions that I see here. Okay. Um, there's a question that indicates for the rehiring by June 30th of 2020, do you just have to show that employees have been hired back and paid at restored amount, but nothing to stop you from lowering later? Also, is it an all or nothing? In other words, if you don't get back to 100%, instead only 95%, then does that not help? So on the first part, um, so you bring all your employees back, um, by June 30th, so you're golden. You don't have to worry about that reduction of your forgivable amount because of the reduction of FTEs or a reduction in salary for an individual person. Right now, there is absolutely no guidance that indicates what happens if you turn around and lay all those folks back off July 2nd. Um, I can't give you a clear answer on that. There has not been any guidance on that. So right now we're still um, advising folks to do your best to get them back by June 30th, if you can, um, if you had reductions prior to that. Um, the second part, is it only 100% or does partially bringing them back help? Absolutely. Every employee that you can bring back um, will help if you've reduced during that pay period or during that period of time. So make sure that you're doing your best to, to bring those folks back. 
Okay. Um, actually, I may have just spoke. It is an all or nothing thing. You get them, you have to get up to 100% or it's not going to affect that calculation. Um, next question is, so I needed to fire an employee because of performance issues. Um, what happens really with the full-time equivalent calculation and the forgiveness? I think in that case, at least right now, based on current guidance, you're out of luck. And you need to try and fill that position or it is going to be reflected as a decrease in your full time equivalents. Additional question on is forgiveness based on the return to the number of employees or the amount of payroll? Remember, when it's looking at the forgiveness, there's two elements to that. If you reduce employees, they're going to reduce your forgiveness. If you reduce wages to individual employees, they're going to reduce your forgiveness. But if you get back to your full-time equivalents by the end of June, and it, that is based on full-time equivalents, so the number of employees you have, then both of those other calculations get tossed out the window. I have not seen where it says, well, I can get my payroll itself costs back up by the end of June 30. I only seen things that indicate it's based on the actual number of employees that you have as of the end of June. Question on the SUDA payment. So I received my loan April 26th and I paid my SUDA April 28th. Can you use that for uh, an allowable, forgivable amount? Right now, I'm going to tell you that answer is no, because you didn't incur that SUDA expense during your eight week period. You actually incurred that expense when you were paying payroll for January through the end of March. Um, there's a question there on um, what is considered transportation expense? I have not seen anything to indicate that transportation expenses are allowable. So, I know some folks had ventured out there and said, hey, you could deduct gas for your vehicle or things of that nature. I have not seen anything to support that. I could be incorrect. But right now, based on my knowledge, um, those are not allowable costs. I have seen some information out there, say, if you're an agricultural um, person and you are running your tractors in the field, but I think that might even be a stretch. Um, but I have seen some other firms uh, put that out there as a potential. But I, I, I'm not comfortable with that right now. And I would, I guess, basically advise you to leave those out until there's more um, guidance that comes out. Um, next question. Um, we will probably not open until phase two of three after June 30th. So I guess only the utilities of this loan will be forgivable. Um, you're unfortunately in one of those, um, I guess, industries that are closed down and, and maybe not being allowed to come back on board. Um, not sure if the decision yesterday from the Supreme Court in Wisconsin helps you out and if maybe um, you're going to be able to get back to being open a little bit slow, quicker, but practicing obviously the social distancing practices that they're recommending. Um, the question that you pose is actually quite interesting. Um, so yes, only the utilities, if you haven't been paying anyone, if you haven't taken a draw for yourself, if you're you know doing this on a Schedule C, um, make sure that you are doing you know, paying that. If you happen to be an employee, make sure you pay yourself. Uh, you can pay yourself not to work. So make sure you're doing that. Um, I know you may be balancing that with unemployment. Um, so you're going to have to kind of make that decision on your own. But it bring, brings up an interesting point that there is some discussion out there to the extent that you do not spend the money by June 30th on allowable costs, that you will be asked to repay those dollars. 
So say you got this $100,000 PPP loan, you only spent $75,000 of that. Um, there is discussion, or I have read, that you will be asked to repay that $25,000 that you did not spend on allowable costs during that period of time. Also, remember, if you spend those proceeds on unallowable costs, um, unauthorized costs, um, you will be asked to repay that um, at the time that you're finishing up that loan, is my, my understanding, um, as they're trying to wrap that up and determine how much is forgivable and determining that amortization. Um, I skipped over, I think, um, utilities of garbage and TV. Um, I certainly believe that both those could be included as well as utilities. Um, I don't, I didn't see them specifically listed out. Um, the TV, I think, certainly frequently is wrapped in with an internet package even. So I, I think you could certainly uh, deduct those as well. If an owner is paid payroll and distributions, are they both considered forgivable? So if you happen to be an S corporation in this case, and you have taken a payroll check and you also take distributions, the distributions do not count. Those are not part of the PPP calculation and those are not part of what would be considered payroll costs and therefore they would not be forgivable. Your paycheck would be. On the flip side, if you happen to be a partnership, you shouldn't be taking a payroll check. Um, so those distributions, just like a sole proprietor, would be considered to be uh, forgivable. Next question is, how do you handle a utility bill that partially covers a forgivable period and partially covered a period prior to the loan? The advice is to take that and um, allocate it based on the number of days. So if you got your PPP monies on April 15th and that is going to get you through June, say it comes to um, the end of June and you pay a bill June 1, that is for all of June, but your money is, is your eight week period is done on June 14th. Don't know if I have my eight weeks exactly right, so don't hold me on this one, but you would have to prorate that. So if the bill was $1,000, you would only be able to take 500 bucks of that. So you're gonna have to look at the number of days that the bill covers. Um, Next question is, what if we have 1099s for individual subcontractors? Would those funds be forgivable also? No, um, none of the payments, if you are paying subcontractors were included, includable in your PPP loan application, nor are they considered to be forgivable costs as part of you wrapping up your PPP loan. Please confirm which earnings you should you should be using for self-employment partners, eight week period earnings or earnings from 2019 times eight divided by 52. It's the latter. So you would take your 2019 earnings, multiply that times eight and divide by 52. And that's the amount that you're allowed to take for yourself as being forgivable expenses uh, for your loan. Earnings are line 31 from your Schedule C. I think that's right. I'd have to pull up the tax form. I don't remember the line numbers, but I believe that to be correct. Would it be current liability since unforgivable would be longer than a year? Um, I think this relates to Dana, how we had them set up the account within QuickBooks. We were advising um, people to set it up as a current liability, mainly because you know, the emphasis is on trying to maximize the loan forgiveness and hopefully by the time you hit the end of your period, the full amount of your PPP loan would be forgiven. That's why we use current liability. Certainly, uh, Dana, are they able to switch it to long-term liability later if a portion ends up being not forgivable and is repaid over that two-year period? Definitely, we can always change the account type to be the long-term liability, or we can move the remaining balance from that current liability to a long-term liability. Definitely, it's a possibility. 
And I think if you're more comfortable setting it up as long term from the get go, um, we're OK with that, too. We just wanted to make sure that folks were recording that initially as a liability, as a means to help track whether or not they were, in fact, spending the, the funds as intended. Um, so can you record the forgiveness prior to the actual forgiveness from the government? Um, well, they did come out with some additional guidance yesterday, basically indicating that as long as your PPP funds were less than $2 million, they are accepting in good faith your certification that you were affected by the COVID and that you were eligible for the PPP funds. As long as then you are demonstrating and showing that you're using them for the allowable costs during the covered period, which makes them forgivable. Yes, I believe you can do that as you go. I also think it's the best way for you to be able to track how much is going to be forgiven. Um, that's just our opinion and our, I guess, our recommendations for trying to track them most efficiently. How do you keep track of the expenses that are not to be used for the forgiven loan? So I'm assuming this question is meaning you're using the proceeds for something other than what they're intended for as part of the PPP. Um, so if you're using the proceeds for something that you think isn't going to be forgiven, um, you're really treading on some, I guess, grounds of whether or not you're going to have to pay that all back um, at the end of that period. If you are using it outside of your eight-week period, but for allowable costs, you're just going to treat them um, as you would any other expense, but still put those in the separate folder that Dana has referred you to, so that you would have that to provide to your uh, lender at the time um, that you are finalizing that loan. Dana, maybe this one is for you. Do you do a journal entry to pull the payroll out of your expenses at the end of the year? Payroll will not match your 941s, W3, et cetera. I do we that. are not advising that you pull the payroll out of the expense accounts. That's why I set up that other income account that we would do the journal entry, debiting the loan, crediting the other income. The other income account will end up offsetting your payroll expenses. So we'll leave the payroll in the wage expense account so they will continue to match your W-2s, W-3. Yeah. Next question is, can you define full-time equivalents? Uh, for this purpose, full-time equivalents is defined as working 30 hours per week. It is based on the ACA guidance. So <laughs> utilize 30 hours per week for any of the full-time equivalent calculations. Next question, what about someone that is on maternity leave and will come back after the eight week period? Um, I'm assuming it's unpaid maternity leave. So if that is the case, you would obviously have a reduction in your wages. Um, but again, as long as you restore to your full-time equivalents by the end of June, there shouldn't be an impact to that. If I'm misunderstanding that question, please uh, pose something additional, and I will try to do my best to answer it better. We are looking at FTE, not number of employees, correct? Yes, that is correct. So make sure you are looking at it based on the number of hours divided by 30. So if you have you know, a lot of part-time folks, you're going to total up their hours and divide by 30 to come up with your full-time equivalent. So if someone's hours are increased, that would count towards the FTE, right? Yep, you are exactly right. That would count towards the FTE. Is there any guidelines on giving raises to employees or bonuses? Boy, I've heard that question a lot over the last uh, uh, month or so. There is not any uh, guidelines. Um, obviously, if it's a well-paid person making over $100,000, it's not going to help you to give that person a raise or 
a bonus because you're limited on how much you can utilize for payroll costs for that individual anyway. In regards to the other part, there, there is not any guidance. Um, I've been advising my clients, just be smart. Um, you know, don't all of a sudden uh, pay out bonuses to yourself or your family or things of that nature, because it's probably going to be construed as not utilizing those funds appropriately. We've um, kind of off topic, related topic, We've had a lot of people ask about what about hazard pay? Again, no specific guidance, but I think you can really have justification for paying someone an additional amount uh, right now to uh, encourage them to come to work, to reward them for coming to work, to you know, somewhat compensate them if they happen to be one of the frontline workers. So um, I believe you can do that and it, and it would certainly be justi justified. Um, I listed, must be, this must be the transportation one. If I listed the transportation one earlier on my slides, I apologize. That must mean that I had a typo um, or took that information and, and put it on there. I do not believe utilities um, or transportation really should be considered as part of the utility. So I apologize for that. We have landlines and cell phone lines for businesses. Can we deduct both? I would say certainly. I don't think there's not anything that says you wouldn't be able to deduct both. Um, obviously, you have business reasons for having both. I don't think you can go out and suddenly get yourself a cell phone and, and start a new contract and have that be deductible because it would have needed to be in place. But if you've always had them, absolutely, I think you can deduct both. Um, can I clarify what the June 30th date means? Eligible forgiveness, forgivable expenses only through June 30th? So the June 30th date really is relevant for two things. One, to um, have you restore to your full-time equivalents if you had any reductions in staff. And two, even though they may not be forgivable, to use your PPP funds for allowable costs. Um, and remember, if they're not forgivable, but they're allowable, then it's going to roll into that PPP loan. Going to finish up on the slides real quick, and then um, we can certainly, there still seems to be a number of questions out there, continue to answer those. Just don't want to keep you too much beyond the time, but I will certainly hang around and answer those if people wish to stay on, or we will um, answer those so that you can see those um, in a document later. So requesting the forgiveness, uh, remember that is something that you will do through your lender. Um, the, each lender right now, I'm assuming, is putting together what they would want to see for documentation, and they may very well be still waiting on guidance from SBA for that. But as Dana indicated, the best thing you can do is fully document what you've utilized your PPP funds for. And an easy way to do that is either to track that within your software and also have the hard copies of what you actually paid so you can provide uh, copies of those documents to your lender. Um, once you submit that, your lender will uh, make a decision within 60 days is my understanding on that forgiveness. Pretty favorable repayment terms. Um, I hear someone typing. If you can mute yourself, that would be ap appreciated. Um, it's pretty favorable repayment terms if you happen to have uh, some of the dollars that weren't forgivable. Um, you won't need to make payments for six months. There will be a two-year repayment term. Uh, the interest rate will be 1%, and there is no collateral or personal guarantee for that particular loan. Um, this is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, that was the additional guidance. Um, well, first of all, if you happen to get a PPP loan over $2 million, the SBA has indicated they will be auditing your use of those funds. Not sure who's going to do that audit, not sure when that's going to happen, but that's what they have indicated at this point. Uh, they had also originally included a caveat that says, and others as 
considered necessary or something to that effect. Well, I think they saw the uh, error in their ways along that and realized that, hey, there's no way that we're going to have resources to be able to do that. So they came out with some additional guidance yesterday, basically indicating, no, you're not going to be uh, subject to audit, at least not from them on those particular items. And the lender will be able to rely upon the documentation that you provide to them. We do have a loan calculator available as a tool that we're happy to share with you as well um, and can make sure that we get that out to you. And with that, um, that brings us to our one o'clock hour. I know that there are still some questions that are out there. Um, I will, um, Autumn, are you on? Yep, yep. Um, I've also recorded all the questions um, and have those available in a document. So if you didn't want to stay on and listen to um, a few additional questions, we can definitely send that document out along with the recording um, and have sort of a FAQ sheet for you. So, um, Autumn, do you suggest I continue to answer these questions or should we just include them in a FAQ document? Um, I mean, if you see any that you think would be um, quick to answer, otherwise, of course, we don't want to keep people on um, too much longer than we need to. Um, so really, it's up to you. Okay. Um. Well, I'll cover a couple of them here real quick. Um, so you covered a fired employee. Am I assume the same is true if an employee resigned? Um, yes. Even if an employee resigns, uh, they are still going to affect your uh, calculation on whether or not you restored to the full-time equivalent. Are you hearing that the forgiveness eight weeks may be extended out beyond eight weeks and could be retro to middle of March based on the shutdown dates? There are recommendations. Um, we're part of the AICPA, which is our national organization for CPAs. They are certainly advocating for some flexibility with that eight week period. I've not really heard any discussions of that being considered or what might be happening with that. So right now we're sticking to the original eight week period. Certainly if that changes, great, because I think it will be very beneficial for a lot of folks, um, but have not heard that that is changing yet. Um, we have employees that don't work every payroll. Should we still count them as employees? Remember, you need to base it on full-time equivalents. So take their hours, divide it by 30. Um, so if you have, you know, three people each working or six people and they work um, every other week, three of them one week, three of them the next week, you're going to take the total hours for all of them and divide it by, you know, 30 to come up with your full-time equivalents. Will there be a replay available? Yes, as Autumn just mentioned, we'll be sending that out as a link to you and you can certainly listen to that again um, if you so, so choose. If a sole proprietor had a loss in 2019, are there distributions still allowed? Uh, no, um, if you had a loss in 2019, your PPP funds are based on zero income for yourself. So you would not be allowed to have any distributions, at least count towards the PPP for this purpose. At least that's my understanding. This is my first year as a Schedule C sole proprietor. How do I determine my earnings? Should it be based on what I was making before the epidemic or based on my W-2 income from last year? Um, it would be based on, there is additional guidance for if you were not open yet in 2019, I would suggest for that one, you reach out to whomever your accountant is to work through that because um, you would need to determine that in order to 
um, determine your PPP funds that would be available to you as well. We are looking at full-time equivalents, not number of employees, correct? Yep, um, I think I answered that one. Yes, so that is true. If self-employed earning, earnings are transferred to a personal account monthly, should that continue or should a check be written out? If you have the ability to do that online, just make sure you're keeping that documentation that that's what it was for, is that you were paying yourself, and that certainly is acceptable. Join late, but the loan proceeds be used 100% for payroll, or does it have to be 75-25? Um, if you have enough payroll costs to use 100% towards payroll, you could certainly um, utilize them. That way, there is no requirement that you use 25% for the other non-payroll costs. You just can't use more than 25%. We allocate a payroll that has already been paid where the pay period is partially in our eight-week period. Yes, that's one of those um, items that can cause uh, issues. So yes, allocated either based on actual hours worked or simply take the days um, and allocate it based upon that. Is dental vision a forgivable payroll cost? Uh, no, it was only group health insurance that was included as a forgivable payroll cost. Do health and other employee insurance costs have to be reduced by the employee portion withheld? Yes, it's only your portion that you are paying so you can't take credit for the amount that the employee is paying. We have part-time employees that work anywhere from five to 25 hours per week. Can we count partial FTEs? Um, certainly when you take all their hours and you're dividing it by 30, if you come up with uh, 9.25, you can do that. It doesn't say that you have to um, round that to any particular number. So okay. I see there, there a cover. Yep. Um, I think there's also been a few questions, um, like we said, about a link to replay this um, and then how we would be sending out the FAQ document. So anyone who is registered for this, we will send it out um, in the same emails that you received or this, from the same email address, which you received the access information for this webinar. So be sure to check your email um, and be sure that if you don't see it in the next week, maybe check your spam folder. Um, we will also have a lot of this information available on our website. Um, so please be sure to check out not only Kerberos.com, but Kerberos.com slash COVID-19 resources. There's a lot of really great information on there to help you deal with some of these new legislative issues we're all facing. So. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to Karen or Dana as well. Thank you so much.